How about that this morning? Wow. Amen. It is uh, good to be in the house of the Lord this morning and just to be able to sing songs of praise and to, to remember uh, what was a very, very uh, unique week in the life of Scripture and in the life of Jesus. At the close of today's message, uh, we will be participating in a time of communion. And so if you did not pick up your communion uh, elements this morning, uh, please raise your hand and a member of the praise team, if y'all can grab those and uh, just get to the folks who have their hands raised, uh, we'll be sure to get and bring one to you. Uh, you'll notice that we no longer have uh, the, the zip Ziploc plastic bags. Um, so we're, we're trying to, uh, to, to be, be mindful of waste. And so as we uh, partake of communion in a few minutes, there'll be a basket that'll be passed from the back to the front for you to drop your empty cups into, and that'll help us a great deal. So I'll remind you about that uh, when the time comes. Uh, I want to mention to you a, a resource uh, that's available out in the foyer uh, at the same, same place where you picked up. I got hooked. Same place where you picked up your communion elements. Um, this is a reading plan for this week. And so one of the things that uh, we're desirous of doing is kind of seeing the, the breadth of this whole week. Uh, and what it meant uh, in the life of Jesus and what it means to us today. And so you'll have uh, some, some reading assignments for each, each day, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the way uh, for the rest of the week. And I would encourage you to pick one of these up. Uh, we'll primarily be following uh, along in, in the Gospel of Luke's narrative, uh, but there's other scriptures that I've put in there for, for you to, to look at as well. And I really encourage you just to spend some time with this, just to immerse yourself uh, into the text uh, for the next few days so that you can uh, get, get the, the scope of, of what is going on this week. Um, if you'll just spend a few, few minutes each day, uh, I believe that you will be blessed and reminded or even come to know the love of God by spending time with, with Him and His Word this week. Uh, we are hitting pause on our Roman series. I was out last week, and then we're hitting pause on our Roman series this week. Um, I'll touch a little bit on Romans uh, next week and kind of the resurrection implications in the book of Romans. Uh, but then the week after that, we'll jump right back into our Romans series. Uh, so if you, if you brought your Romans journals, uh, still, still hang on to those. We're going we're gonna to jump back into the text uh, here in just a few weeks. But today, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to be opening to John chapter 12. John uh, chapter 12. Uh, the story of Jesus's uh, triumphal, excuse me, I had a big breakfast this morning. Um, <laughs> the story of Jesus' triumphal entry is actually found in all four Gospels. Uh, so you can see this story played out in, in various ways, and we're, we're going to kind of look at a text that's going to remind us. We're going to back up just a little bit uh, to what happened yesterday. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot uh, of things that, that we don't know in, in terms of context as it relates to Scripture. Uh, so, for instance, you know, a good Bible student around Christmas time every year, a good Bible student is going to say, well, you know that we don't know actually when Jesus was born. Uh, a good Bible student is going to bring that out because, no, we don't. We don't know when Jesus was born, but we celebrate the Christmas season and celebrate the birth of Christ uh, during that time. Um, but one of the things that we do know, and I don't have time to go into all the, the, the research and the, and the logic that, that, that unfolds here, but one of the things we do know is we do know um, the, the, the final week of Jesus' life. We know when that took place. It was around this, this time of year, the spring season. And so we, we, we do have, you know, dates that kind of go along with that. And so uh, what we want to do is, is we want to kind of help uh, us as a faith family see the scope of that week. Uh, there is over 3,700 verses in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you look and open to your New Testament and you see the four Gospels, there's over 3,700 verses. Now, you've heard me say before that the chapters and verses weren't there when it was originally written, uh, but they are helpful for us finding texts like we are trying to do today. But, but when that was uh, originally written, those 3,700 verses, over 30, there was one-third of all those verses. One-third, think about this. One-third of all those verses, talking about the life of Jesus, 
are focused on his final week here on earth. Just think about that. 33% of all the gospels, one week. And when we stop and, and we consider the implications of what the gospel writers are trying to impress upon their readers of the day and what they, I believe, they are trying to impress upon us, the church, today, uh, yes, we remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus every single week. But, to, but this week, we want to give special attention to what the gospel writers gave special attention to. They gave special attention to this final week of Jesus' life. And when it comes to Palm Sunday, the Sunday right before Easter, the story that just was read by, by some of our students, at that time, the, the people who were present on that day, the people who actually brought the, the palm branches and laid them uh, for, for Jesus to, to cross over, there were some serious uh, misunderstandings about what they believed Jesus was going to do and what he actually did. The New Testament writers know fully well that the, these Hosanna cries of Sunday will by Friday turn into calls for crucifixion. So this entry into Jerusalem is laced with all kinds of irony. It, it really is much about as us as it is about these people in ancient Jerusalem because those that were calling him blessed are going to be those who crucify him. And we're reminded that there's no route to an empty tomb except by the way of the cross. And so we're going to reflect on that here in just a few moments as we participate in communion together. And we'll give even more focused attention to that reality on Friday night at our Good Friday service. So I mentioned it once, but I'll mention it again. I, I hope that you will plan to be here Friday night at 6.30 for that. And we hold this entire week together in context. But I do want to back up a day. What happened yesterday? And so in John chapter 12, if you'll read along with me, starting in verse 1, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining with, at the table with him. So uh, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and he comes to and he, he stops in Bethany. Now, if, if we even went back another chapter, if we went back to John chapter 11, what we remember in John chapter 11 is that, that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And we read over that like, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> but Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And so Jesus stops in Bethany where this happened, where he raised Lazarus from the dead. And it's pretty much uh, the same custom in every culture. Uh, that if somebody raises you from the dead, you throw them a party, right? <laughs> I mean, any culture. That's, that's, what, that's what you should do. And so Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, they're giving Jesus a party. It, it's this party of, of hey, you know, you know, thank you for raising me from the dead. It's the nicest thing anybody's ever done for me. You know, thank you for that. And here's this party. And so they're all together having this, this meal. And in verse 3, Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet, and she wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Verse 4, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used uh, to help himself to what was put into it. Verse 7, leave her alone. I love that. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial You'll always have the poor among you, but you'll not always have me. 
We've already had a beautiful day of, of worship this morning. I loved seeing the looks on your faces and on the faces of those who were worshiping it. But I don't want us to miss this act of worship here that we see in the text. This beautiful display that Mary was at Jesus' feet. She was at his feet in the previous chapter in John chapter 11. And she's, she's crying out at that time, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. Now she's at his feet again. She finds herself at the feet of Jesus. And what she is doing is she is anointing Jesus with the most valuable thing that she possessed. I don't know if, if we can really put this in the proper context. Like, I, I don't have an object that's worth a whole year's salary. I mean, uh, you know, uh, aside from maybe your home or something, I don't have an, an object that I can hold in my hand that's worth a whole year's salary. But this is what, this is what Mary had. She had this, this pure nard, this Nepalese plant, and it was so expensive because it had to be imported, but it also had to be extracted from the plant. And so it was very costly, Scripture tells us, worth a year's salary. And she let her, her hair down, if you caught that in the text, which was a cultural no-no in those days. Women didn't just let their hair down in public. This would be, as one scholar says, be the equivalent of, of like a, a woman in a long uh, dress, kind of hiking that dress up in the middle, middle of a dinner party. It just would be culturally inappropriate. And th this is what Mary is doing. She's letting her hair down because she's willing to risk it all because she loved and adored Jesus. Hmm. And this is such a beautiful picture to me because by and large, uh, we are a pretty reserved people, all right? We, uh, we sometimes sit with our arms crossed. And we're skeptical. We're cynical. We're a, a people that, you know, are, are just reserved by and large. We control our emotions. We control our tears. We're taught to control our tears. So I'm, I'm thankful when I hear a baby cry because that, that's what babies do, right? Amen? <laughs> but we're taught to control that. I've even heard, you know, people at funerals like, don't, don't cry. You know, like, why? Why are we, why are we taught to, to control that in, in that way? So here's a woman who was transformed by the resurrection power of Jesus, and she didn't care who was watching Everything I have is yours, Jesus. A year's salary, boom. My image around others, I don't care about my image. My hair, Jesus, you are worthy of it all. And Mary unashamedly responded to his worth-ship by worship. So a couple of questions for us today is, is, do we come in this house of worship with that kind of devotion to worship. Do you come to worship with that kind of devotion? Not just, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let the praise team and I'll let Kevin do his thing. No, the only reason that Kevin and the praise team are up here is to invite you to participate in giving glory and honor to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's why they're here. And so it reminds me of, you know, one of my, my favorite movies, uh, the movie with Robin Williams called Patch Adams, and I love that scene where the you know, guy's like, hey, you know, how many fingers am I holding up? You know, and he's like, well, you know, four. He's like, no, it's not four. You got to look through the problem, and then you see eight fingers. Oh, wow. You know, it's like, and, and so th this is the reminder for us that Matthew 5, 16, that let your light so shine that they, they may see your good deeds and what? And praise your Father in heaven. It is a reflection and so anybody who, who steps on this stage, it's, it's not for us to be seen, it's for you to see God, for you to be pointed to God, for you to be pointed for the, to the love of God and, and the grace that is Jesus Christ. That, that, is, that is the goal, that is the desire. So the second question is this, is the aroma of your home Christ-centered? How may the aroma of your home become 
more Christ-centered. It's one thing for Christ to be exalted in this room, which he absolutely should be. But what does it look like when you go outside this room? What does it look like in your own home? What's the aroma? And I'm not, I'm not suggesting in any way that, oh, you should be, you know, a, a perfect, you know, kind of, I'm not suggesting that at all. But, but the text says that, that, that there was, that this, this house was filled with the fragrance. Did you catch that? The house was filled with this. And so if you come into this house every week to honor Jesus, but you don't honor Christ in your own home, I beg of you to repent, to, to, to turn. It's just a simple word that just means to turn, to change, change direction. Men, if this is you, repent. This just means turn from your sin. Turn, turn from, from treating everybody around you, you know, like a jerk. Turn from that. Fix your eyes on Jesus and begin to follow his path. Judas looked like a disciple of Jesus. He spoke like a disciple of Jesus. He wore the mask pretty well. And I believe one of the telltale signs of Judas's mask was his critical spirit. Oftentimes, criticism says more about the critic than it does about the one being criticized. How critical are you of those around you? How critical are you of the church? How critical are you of church leadership? That spills over to, to those around us. I'm, I'm constantly amazed at what my, my children hear. You know, you, you think you're having a conversation in another room, you know, with your, and, then, and just they, they pick up on it. Now, they don't hear when I say go clean the room, but if I say, hey, there's ice cream, it's like they come running from three miles away. There's a dessert. Here we are. We heard you say that. Or you told me three, three days ago and 17 hours ago that, that, that we were going to have a dessert this night. Where's it at? Like, how do you, I don't even remember what I did five minutes ago. And you remember what I did three days? Seven, you know. So th there's this reality of discipleship that we need to be reminded of. Judas's heart was not one of generosity. He didn't care about the poor. Judas wore a mask. He went to church, he checked all the boxes, but Judas ultimately wasn't interested in living the Jesus way. He was only interested in this Christian thing if it led to personal gain. And this is sobering to me because the spirit of Judas lives on today. So men turn from living some double standard life, fix your eyes on Jesus, uh, join a man church small group or go to the man church class that's happening right after service today or, or go to another class. We have so many classes that are designed to, to be in a smaller group community that helps you get into the word and to, to do life with other people. You know, this, this whole idea of, of doing life together, you'll see it as one of our next steps out here in the foyer on the wall. It's not just some religious checklist. Ladies, I'm not just singling out the men. Ladies, get into small group community with other spirit-filled women who can walk alongside you, who can be there for you, who can, who can pray with you, who can, who can just help you in those, those times where we all need help. So I want to encourage us to, to think about that as a next step. Maybe that's one of your next steps. Becoming a disciple of Jesus, it takes discipline. And as we submit ourselves to the Spirit of God, that very Spirit produces change in our lives. And so I, I don't know about you, but I'm becoming more and more aware that I don't need more information. I need transformation. I, I need a transformed heart because I know me. I know me, and I know that there's only one way that I can come into a relationship with God, and that's through Jesus, or else I just start following the crowd. Look in verse 9 of John 12. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews 
found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. Somebody down the street said they were raised from the dead. My guess is we'd go check it out. Or we at least, you know, see somebody who was live streaming. And we'd be checking it out. What's, what's happening? What's going on with that? They wanted to see Lazarus, who'd been raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans, catch this, to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Church, this is the ultimate danger of power. Mm. The chief priest said, if this whole Lazarus being raised from the dead is causing people to follow Jesus, then kill Lazarus. Get him out of the way. And you may, you may not, I pray that you do not murder somebody this week. But how often do we murder somebody in our heart? Get rid of them. I don't want to deal with them. Get them out of here. How often do we murder somebody in our heart? And Jesus would say that hate in our heart, he equates that to murder. This is what he would say in his longest recorded sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. So now you see the context of Palm Sunday. You see what led up to Palm Sunday, John 12, 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. Verse 13, they took palm branches and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Then John describes Jesus riding on a donkey, this fulfillment of prophecy from Zechariah 9.9. It's one of the texts that I encourage you to read this week in your reading plan. As it's written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. There was another king who, who rode in on a donkey back in, in the Old Testament. In 1 Kings chapter 1, Solomon rides in on a mule. Except Solomon's kingdom didn't work out so well. Solomon was, was turned to idols. He was turned to, to away from God. And, and so now there's a, there's a king who is riding in on a, on a donkey who is going to usher in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. He's going to tell his followers, this is the kingdom that I want you to seek first. Not, not that kingdom that, that Solomon tried to create, but the kingdom of Jesus, who is the good king. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And these, these phrases, they don't just come out of nowhere. They don't just come out of thin air. They come from Psalm 118. Verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 24, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Anybody remember singing that song as you were growing up? This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. It wasn't just talking about any old day. It was talking about a specific day. This is the day. Save us, verse 25. We pray, O Lord. Does that sound familiar? Hosanna. Hosanna. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God. He has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up on the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Later in the book of Daniel, Daniel prophesies that the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. And so the, the crowd is, they're expecting this, this king to come in. To, to ride in on this, this war horse and to free them from oppression, in particular Roman oppression. And so, yeah, there's, there's some misunderstanding of what they think is going to happen. And the crowd expected Jesus to rise to power. And instead, Jesus lays his power down. He lays it down freely. Nobody takes my life from me. 
I give it freely. And so on Monday, Jesus, tomorrow, Jesus leaves Bethany and he weeps over Jerusalem. On Tuesday, Jesus curses a fig tree and confounds the arguments of his enemies. On Wednesday, Scripture is kind of silent about this, but Jesus is, is definitely preparing for Passover and, and Judas is preparing to get Jesus, Jesus arrested. Thursday, Jesus shares a meal with his disciples. So look with me in the next chapter. See how this all is fitting together. And see the implications that it has in our own life. John 13, verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the mill, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He demonstrates the way of the cross. Jesus is demonstrating the life of a servant king. This beautiful gift that Mary showed Jesus of washing his feet is the very gift that Jesus gives his disciples. He washes their feet. Did you catch that? Verse 14, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Several years ago, I was, I was convicted in my spirit. I wasn't being the husband that I was called to be. I wasn't being the spiritual leader of my home that God had called me to be. And I, I remember going on a, a weekend away with several other men, men who, who loved the Lord and men who showed that they loved me. They served me all weekend long. And I was so humbled in my spirit. I was so brought back to this, this nature of Christ. And the first thing that I did when I walked in my home, it was before we had kids, is I sat my wife down and I washed her feet. And there's, there's nothing I've had somebody wash my feet before. And let me just say, it is uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable. But it was, it was a, a symbol to my wife that things are about to change. By the power of God's spirit living inside of me and dwelling inside of me, I am going to allow the fruit of that spirit to live inside of me. The other gospel writers tell us Jesus took some bread. And he said, this is my body given for you. He took a cup and he said, this, this is the new covenant, a new agreement. This is a new way. So, so you remember the blood of the lamb that covered the doorpost in Egypt and death passed over the Israelites, the Passover meal. You, you've done the Passover meal, but now my death, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. My death, my suffering, my blood will be poured out for you for your sin. For your sin. For God so loved the world. And he gave his only son. I'm going to ask some of our shepherds to begin making their way to the back for our time of communion. Uh, as a reminder, this is our first week without the individual Ziploc bags. And so in a moment, a container is going to be making its way down your aisle. And we'll, we'll just ask you to pass that into the row in front of you to put your, your empty container in. Uh, each week as we gather, we remember the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And we really com continue this beautiful act of, of worship alongside Jesus' followers all over the world. Catch this. It's, it's all over the world. This was, uh, I heard this prayed earlier today. It, it, we're, we're, it's not just us gathered in this room, but it is, it is 
Jesus followers gathered in Rwanda, Africa. Jesus followers are gathering in, in Honduras. Jesus followers are, are, are gathering 10 miles down the road at the Roosevelt City Church of Christ. Jesus followers are gathering in churches all over this city. And so it's not just those of us in, his, in this room who are participating in this meal. And I want you to imagine being there with those first disciples. Can you see it? Can you see it? Can you see Jesus? I want to invite you to close your eyes just for a moment and imagine Jesus saying those words as you, he hands you a simple piece of bread. And he says, do this. And when you do it, remember me. Let's pray for the bread this morning. God, we reflect on the reality of your sinless son giving his body as a sacrificial lamb in order to pay for our sin debt. Father, we can't fathom what it would be like to walk this earth sinless because all of us have, have sinned and messed up yet Jesus walked this earth fully human fully divine and the grace that he displayed is such an act of love that has no equal and so we rest in that truth as we remember or we reflect on our sins that put in there we we just bring those before you and lay those at the foot of the cross right now I thank you for your promise that as far as the east is from the west, that you, you remember our sin no more. So, Father, we reflect on your love that redeems us for the scandal of the message of Christ crucified. That is that we can't add anything to it. It is finished. So we receive your grace this morning as we partake of the bread. In Jesus' good name, amen the body of Christ given for you. Let's eat. And we'll pray for the cup. God, we now reflect on the truth that your son's blood was poured, was poured out. And it's cleansed us of all of our sins. So we remember that beautiful sacrifice as we take the cup in Jesus' good name. Amen. The blood of Christ given for you. After you partake your empty cups, please place them in the container as it makes its way down. If you'll pass that to the person in front of you. I want to invite our singers to be making their way back to the stage. We're just going to sit for a moment as they collect on the stage. Uh, if you came prepared to give today, you may, you may do so by giving online, or there'll be containers available in the foyer, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. Each one must give as they have decided in their heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver.